Hello, everyone. Welcome, one and all. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is January 7th. Happy New Year. It's 2024. And it is 4 p.m. in cloudy Northern California. Actually, the sun's out, but it's still cold up here. So I welcome you here, and uh, we have a very, very special guest. I'm very excited about today's show. Uh, his name's Mr. Matt Williamson. Very briefly, because I want to get into the conversation as quickly as I can. He's a writer, primarily. He's an analyst, a um, highly analytical, perceptive mind. And he produces a program called Pop Goes the 60s. And there's a link right in the description here. I hope you go to his web page. It's very nicely designed, which is one of the questions I want to ask. <laughs> Who did the graphics? It's really, really nice and very 60s pop. And um, so today we're going to talk about um, some of the published, that is either articles or mostly books. And there's a huge volume of them that are coming out uh, over the past several years as, as the boomers age out and a new group of people become fascinated with the Beatles. Uh, we're going to talk about that. Um, we're going to talk about um, beyond the who, where, and why, because there's all kinds of great books on that very topic. Um, I want to talk about the what's called uh, historiography. Okay, don't get scared by that, people. All right, and welcome David Underdown. Hey, it's Detroit Dave. <laughs> We've got uh, Matt Williamson here from Milwaukee. Maybe you can do a meetup or something because you know, I know it's not that you're not next door neighbors, but you're in the same region, the beautiful Midwest, which I love through Bowling Green. And then there's Kathy, Sue, Ms. Ruby, and others. So we're going to talk about hey. everybody's uh, favorite group they either love or hate. And we'll talk about the haters as well, because believe it or not, there are some. And um, what got me interested in Mr. Williamson's work is that I saw, I've been watching his channel for quite a bit, but I was especially intrigued by Professor Aaron Torkelson Weber, who had published a book, this is in 2016, in an academic press by the McFarland. It's called The Beatles and Historians, The Historians. And then more recently, he had uh, Dr. John Stewart, who was also a member of a um, British pop band, uh, a doctorate, uh, holder of a doctorate who authored more recently, Dylan, Lennon, Marx, and God. And this is Cambridge, no less. Cambridge University Press, 2022. So the Beatles, um, and I hope this doesn't hurt them in any way, their, their legacy, but they've gotten the attention of um, um, academic types, right? And usually that spells the end of anything beautiful and good and wholesome. But Hopefully, we can prevent that from happening. So with no further ado, I'd like to bring in Mr. Matt Williamson. I'm going to ask him, because obviously you didn't grow up with the Beatles, and I wanted to find out how someone of your generation, Mr. Williamson, got into the Beatles. You even have a lava light in the background. Welcome, Matt. Thank you, and thank you for having me on, Professor. I really um, I've enjoyed your channel for many years now. and. Uh, learned a lot from you but I, I and I liked some of your Beatle content you would drop that in and that that's what caught my ear and what caught my ear when I was a little kid was I, I just loved love music I love playing records and spinning records and for many years I just before I could read I just played whatever was around and that time at that time it was just 60s music and uh, I grew up in a place that I had a, a next-door neighbor named Dan who had seven older brothers and sisters and lots of records. It was all 60s stuff. So that's how I got my start. Yeah, that's interesting. I had friends who had bro older brothers and sisters. So they were out listening to all the cool groups and had the really interesting books and magazines. And one of my friends, his father was a stereophile. So I went to a party there and listened to his, uh, I think it was the White Album. Or maybe that was his older brother. His older brother had the White Album on an A-track. And so he used to drive us to school and we used to hear listen to the White Album. <laughs> anyway, this is this conversation is not about me. I'm sure we can go on and on about it. It's it's about um, and thank you very much uh, for introducing me to a, a new body of scholarship. It's because I've been asleep at the wheel on so far as the Beatles is concerned, including tune in 
Mark Lewis on. He's British himself, which, and I mention that because I think the cultural specificity of understanding the Beatles is very, very important. It uh, requires someone from that cultural background to uh, fully appreciate, understand some of the references and so on. Volume one. And then here's the book that I name checked just a moment ago by Dr. John Stewart, Dylan Lennon, Marx and God. Find that very interesting uh, reading. Um, I'm not going to go into some sort of nitpick uh, discussion of it, but um, I wanted to find out from you, Mr. Williamson, what was your, um, what have you seen as ha has been the failing in a lot of this, this literature on the Beatles? Because obviously you're totally steeped into the whole Beatles uh, phenomenon as well as the music in general. Yes, I, I noticed very early on when I started buying books on the Beatles, I was in my teens and it was the 1980s. So that was the post John Lennon is murdered period when all this Beatles stuff in the 60s music came back and lots of books were being written. So you, what I didn't realize at the time were the biases that many of these writers brought to these books and these narratives. And the name that you had uh, dropped earlier, Aaron Weber, who wrote uh, The Beatles and the Historians, which is this book right here, Mm -hmm. It really put in per, into perspective the what she categorized as four different narratives of the Beatles. So starting with the Beatles' own narrative when they were a band, and they kind of told their own story. There was a, a biography that was, life, or was authorized by uh, Hunter Davies that came out in 68. That's all called the Fab Four narrative. And that was followed by the Lennon Remembers narrative, or John Lennon in the 70s, uh, with the help of Rolling Stone magazine, pretty much beat up on the Beatles and just tried to destroy the myth, so he said. And then after John Lennon died, there was this uh, the Shout book by Philip Norman further emphasized the Lennon style, how Lennon remembered it, which is basically to rip on Paul McCartney. So there is this idea that Paul Mc John Lennon was three quarters of the Beatles, and that's the Shout narrative. Then finally, we get to the more current day, which is Mark Lewison's Tune In, where, as uh, historiography goes, it takes about 50 years past the events to be able to more accurately tell and catalog history. And that's what Lewison is doing. And he's got his, he, he's not without his detractors, by the way. And it's, it's actually been bubbling up a little bit here lately, which I've been coming up. Uh, coming to find. But generally speaking, Lewison is taking 30 years to write three volumes of the Beatles biography, and uh, he's leaving no stone unturned. So he's trying to tell it straight, and I find it to be very balanced. Am I correct in assuming that, uh, that this is probably, up to this point, the definitive history of the Beatles by it's Lewison? Called that. Yeah, there, prior to this, there was no definitive history of the Beatles so far I, that I'm aware. And mm -hmm. I guess the Beatles version, when they did the anthology in 1995, which was a company, they had a book, a video series, uh, some unreleased music, a couple new songs. That, I guess, was maybe considered it, but that's more their telling of it. So that's always fraught with agenda and you know some whitewashing here and there. And the Beatles themselves get things wrong. There's a lot of people that think that only the principles involved in the history can tell the story. This is not true. In fact, there's some of the most unreliable people to tell the story. <laughs> Especially Lenin. Well, Lenin is a two-edged sword. He 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 goes overboard. He, the way he remembers things, he's very good with words. He's a, he's so um and uh, what's the word um People are drawn to him because his command of the language, and they believe him, and because he does have such a good command of the language. But he has a tendency to, to very, I guess it would be to uh, sum up very big periods of time with a couple of words, and those couple of words take on. Uh, it's almost like a meme for a whole period of Beatle time, and that really has taken hold because Lenin was always so. He showed his vulnerable side. And in America, anyway, that's that's looked upon as uh, a virtue. And uh, really wearing your heart on your sleeve is not a virtue. And it, it doesn't make somebody more trustworthy. And that's one of the things that I find Lenin fans really cling to. 
saying, well, he's so honest. Well, mm -hmm. no, he's not. And it's not because he was trying to be dishonest, but there's drugs involved and there's all kinds of things involved and just the passage of time. And you need other things checking that history to see what is actually accurate. And we've had some time, enough time that has passed so we've been able to do that now. And we can sift through the, the Leninisms, if you will. And he's provided us with a lot of really good stuff that is accurate. But we are, there's so much been written about the Beatles and they've been so discussed and the cameras have been on them for their whole lives that we have the ability to get more close to the truth in spite of some of his, um, his dialogue. Now in uh, literature and like in fiction, and maybe to a certain degree, literary criticism, there's this concept of the unreliable narrator, right? For example, Huckleberry Finn, it's told through the POV of Huckleberry Finn. Is he really reliable in talking about the, uh, the world that he, the, uh, he occupies? So that's part of the historiographic uh, control that I think critics have to exercise. And I think you're really good at it. And um, primarily because you're looking at the Beatles phenomenon in a larger cultural, social, and political context, which I think some of the more recent critics are doing as well. Yeah, the, there's a lot of people that are really skilled at taking a very balanced approach to the Beatles and maybe just focusing on one period of the Beatles, one one thing. Like I, I talked about a, a writer, uh, Andy Bibuke, who's a musician as well. He wrote a book on the Beatles here. And it was an incredibly good book. And I, nobody's ever dedicated that kind of time to just the Beatles guitars and drums. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have a particular favorite that I could tell that he has no horse in the race other than to just explain what they used. And that actually tells a great deal of information. And he's mm -hmm. got receipts and different kinds of documentation that really adds to the story. And that I'm finding is what uh, the historiography and the Beatle biographers today are really taking a, a much more careful and balanced approach because mm -hmm. they have to, otherwise they're called on it. They'll get hammered in uh, social media and it's not mm -hmm. easy to pull the wool over our eyes these days. Right. Well, Lewis on himself, who wrote the book, Tune In, his previous book, I don't know if it's previous, but he did a book previously that was called The Sessions. Mm -hmm. And it was all really detailed, different takes and different uh, reels of tape and the uh, personnel that were involved. We found out more about uh, the engineers, for example, people like Jeff Emmerich. In fact, he wrote his own book, right? And George Martin has written himself two or three. So, yeah, and the Babook book, I don't know how you pronounce his last name. I have that. That was an excellent book. I have yes. first edition. I think he's also a, a vintage guitar dealer oh, or um, an appraiser for a Christie's or some auction house or something like that. But So he has those types of credentials. Now... Um, is there a danger, however, in um, sort of this creeping minutia or nerdism of Beatles studies that we begin to lose the big picture of what they were and what is the big picture? You know, we don't really yeah. understand that fully. Go ahead. I, I think with the, as big as the Beatles still are, I mean, you, you run that risk. And I think mm -hmm. that's just a sideline of having a huge fan base. And I think that there's plenty of different, what I'm finding the the fan bases splinter into different areas. You know, you've got mm -hmm. people who only want to hear positive things about their heroes. You've got people that are more critical. You have people who are just collectors. So it, it runs all kinds of things, and there's a lot of crossover. But some of these subgroups of the fandom do not like each other and do not communicate well. Wow. Well, in preparation for our conversation today and based on uh, some of your other uh, talks on Pop Goes the 60s, I did finally purchase the blue and red remixes of 2023. The Beatles have those anthologies. I have the original ones, mm -hmm. and I listened. I listened very closely. I think I still have to do some more close listening, and uh, maybe I have to do it on different systems, stereo systems, and I have to listen to it on the headphones. But so far as uh, Beatles uh, comprehensivenessism or nerdism or something, I really didn't see much of a benefit in the remix other than one of the tracks of um, the AI Lennon. You know, that's yeah. really what 
is selling that that set. I needed to look at it to see if there were any discernible differences in the mixes. I really didn't hear much. Well, here's an instance where you have the Beatles and their company Apple that are putting forth these releases. Obviously, they own the rights, so they're doing that. So they are, in my opinion, one of the more heavily biased entities that is putting out information on the band. An example would be this new Beatles song that came out. This was from 1978, and the Beatles attempted to do it in the mid-90s with a couple other tracks during the anthology, and it was left undone because it, there was, it was, the, the tape quality wasn't very good, but George Harrison called it fucking rubbish, is what he called it. He didn't <laughs> like it. So here we are, fast forward to now, and somehow McCartney kind of took the reins of this and wanted to finish it. So now what Apple is saying, well, George didn't, didn't dislike the song. He just didn't like the quality of the tape, you know, that the, they're, they're spinning it, you know, and it's, it's, it's really hard to refute his own words you know he had in fact he said that Lenin's writing had had really suffered and wasn't he wasn't a good writer anymore he went that far and he got mm -hmm. a little bit of rebuke from McCartney so this information comes from Paul McCartney by the way mm -hmm. so anyway here we have this new song and um there was a lot of you know obviously a lot of hype for it and I, I wasn't really impressed with it I did I don't think it belongs in the Beatles canon and it, it's clearly not worthy to be next to some of their classics from the 60s so but that's just how they're trying they're they're a corporation and they're trying to make money and they're trying to also reach out to younger fans and that's part of what these remixes were for the the story that they're telling is that they want to have a better separation of the vocals instead of having instruments panned hard right vocals hard left or whatever and because younger people listen on earbuds and a better listening experience would be a better mix of those elements, which is true. I can understand that. But a good mix does not make a song. A good song makes a song. And people are going to listen to good music if it's good music. It's not going to be because of the mix, I believe. So I don't know that this was, I think this may be much ado about nothing. We have all kinds of remixes that have been done now over the years, and it's just getting confusing. Some are good, some are better than others. There's no consensus. Uh, you've got some audio files out there that are, it's really interesting to listen to them because I don't consider myself an audio file, but they'll go into the nuances of the recording and with really good equipment to hear all these little new things. And uh, a lot of people just don't listen in that way. And I'm one of them. I typically listen in an ambient room with, um, you know, without headphones. And you're not going to catch a lot of that stuff if you listen that way. Mm. And maybe I'm in the minority now. I don't know. Well, when radio was still king, um, the top groups, the producers mixed down uh, engineers or engineers themselves, they would take a either a tape or a version of, of the single that they were working on. They would take it out to their car and listen on the over the radio speaker and mix it that way, EQ it that way. Yeah. And I myself, to your point, uh, listen to it on a just a regular home theater, not my home theater, a home theater center speaker to get sort of a general idea. It was a terrible um, sound, by the way. So then I took it to my own little low level stereo system and it sounded much more clear and precise, but I still didn't see much of a discernible difference. And when I heard that the hype about this being redone for the new generation of Beatle fans, to me, that meant, oh, they're going to really pump up the bass, EQ the bass and bring it up, which would be nice because, as you know, as you know, especially in the latter part, Paul McCartney's bass lines were beautiful. Mm -hmm. You know, the counterpoint on the Rickenbacker bass, right? 4001 yeah. Rickenbacker. Yeah, so I was, look, I was hoping for that. And I was also hoping for better separation and high, high mid-range on the uh, vocals. Because that's something that the Beatles, I guess uh, people are completely into them, appreciate their harmonies. But they were up there with the, with the Beach Boys and songs like uh, The Sun King or Sun King. Not The Sun King, Sun King. I wonder if you can go to individual tracks that, um, that you continually go back to. I know one of them is not Revolution 9, but <laughs> beyond well, that's that. That 
requires a lot of discussion, I think. And that's one okay. thing I'd like, to, I'd like to just talk about on my channel in the near future here. But okay. um, some of the songs that, you know, they don't really need any any sweetening. And it's interesting to, to hear when people, like an engineer or these producers, Giles Martin's son, or George Martin's son, Giles, who is, along with Sam O'Kell, has done a lot of these recent uh, remixes. I'm not sure what the initiative was, but it may be to boost some of the bass and the, the bass drum and everything. And I, but I, I still just kind of listen to the music first. And some of the, the little changes do affect me. But um, one of the songs I did like that they the remix was the song Magical Mystery Tour. It just had a better separation of instruments. There's a little more, maybe a little more guitar that you hear on there. But I, I do like the vocals the best. And I don't know that any of these remixes have really done a whole lot to improve the vocals maybe a little bit but um, i'm a big fan of of the three-part harmony especially and mm -hmm. you're right they did rival the beach boys and the beach boys had far more far better equipment to record on too by the way so yeah. this the emi had was not junk but it was they were not up at the times to give you an example yeah. they, the issues with the equipment came out if i can interject about here in this book, Solid State, which is excellent in that regard. But go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, Solid State. So that's when they got a new mixing console when they did the final album, Abbey Road. And it really does sound like a different album. It does sound more modern. And I remember as a kid feeling, what well, this sounds like, it does sound newer. And mm -hmm. I, I remind people, just to give people an idea of how far behind EMI was, uh, the Beatles studio, is in 1965, the Birds recorded Mr. Tambourine Man on an eight track. And the Beatles didn't start using an A-track until partway through the White Album, which is three, over three years later. So that three years in the 60s is a, a, a huge amount of time. So they had to make do with what they had. And that's where George Martin and the engineers that came in, like Emmerich and those guys. Right. Paul McCartney, one of the incentives uh, for moving to the Rickenbacker and is that he really liked the bass sound that labels like Motown were getting in America. And they finally were able to capture, I think, with the new mixing desk, the board, and the, yeah. the uh, new technologies, the multi-tracks. Yeah, I think that they were always listening to American music, and that was hard for them to try to get those sounds replicated without having the proper instrumentation. Mm -hmm. It's interesting if you hear the Get Back sessions and some of the Nagra reels of them discussing how disappointed they are and how they can't get an eight-track player over there. They're like, well, the Beach Boys yeah. What can we, you know, you know, and that's also EMI. <laughs> so yeah, it's funny to hear them really bitch about EMI and Capital because it's hilarious. Yeah. The Beach Boys had Capital uh, recording studios, which Brian Wilson didn't particularly like. Uh, they like Sunset Studios in LA as well. But yeah, I think I remember. I don't know if it's from the documentary itself, Get Back, or from one of the books. Is that they didn't they borrow a George Harrison's? Recorder is Studer recorder, and they brought it over to Twickenham or one of the studios because Magic Alex screwed up and couldn't yeah, get it together. It was from they brought some por portable stuff over uh, for the get back sessions, and yeah. Uh, yeah, they and they made do with it, it worked fine. And for really what they were doing, they that get back stuff, I don't think they needed an eight track. I mean, it's just the four of them, unless they mm -hmm. were going to do it overdubs. And the idea was to give it to a straight, which was more of a live setting anyway. Mm -hmm. Now, Get Back, Get Back, is I call Paul McCartney's first album because that was very primitive. Remember, are you familiar with that one, the one with the bowl of cherries on it? Oh, yeah, the uh, the self-titled, yeah. Self, yeah, McCartney. Yeah, that album is very, it's kind of experimental, and it's kind of, he's just got like bits of songs here and there he's just kind of messing around with. And uh, I think part of that album was, he wasn't quite sure where the Beatles were going because Lennon had basically walked out, but he left the door open. Are we going to record again? And I think that's how that album came to be, which is a charming album. Yeah. Um, now, it was McCartney because, uh, and again, this is the value of the, the books and articles that have been coming out over the past uh, few decades. Uh, I had always assumed since Lennon was so far out there, I thought he was the musical experimentalist. But in truth, it was McCartney. Do you agree with that characterization? 
Yes, McCartney was always pushing the envelope, but particularly by 1966 and 67, because he was living in Swing in London. The other three had moved out to the suburbs. So he was being more exposed to the, the art happenings and the, the live happenings, uh, painters, writers, Stockhausen, all that electronic stuff that was coming through the John Cage period. And mm -hmm. he was the one that was bringing that to Lennon. Check this out, you know. So there's a little bit of competition there too. But Lennon, I think he called up. He said that avant-garde was French for bullshit, is what he said. <laughs> <laughs> he was made of marrying. Maybe the he biggest. He wanted to stick to rock and roll. <laughs> John Lennon. He exactly. But yeah, uh, McCartney had a collection of home tapes that he made, loops and such. He recorded a lot of ambient. What? Music concrete that showed up in let's say the the Wyatt album, and I think one of the so far as a historiography is concerned, one of the factors. And I don't know if McCartney ever listened to them or was aware of the movement. There was a huge movement on the West Coast, on in San Francisco, the San Francisco Tape Center. Mm. Uh, Susan Chiani, for example, were were doing all this type of material. And I think McCartney must have heard these experimentalist work because a lot of it wound up on the White Album. So San Francisco Tape Music Center. Mm -hmm. They said tape music is a medium in itself. Just like there was experimental film, they were going to do experimental audio tape work. And um, there's an archive now, and some of it was in Mills College, which is in the East Bay, San Francisco. And now there's a new book. I don't have it with me. I do have a copy of it that's a comprehensive study of that. I think that needs to go into Beatleology as well, a con consideration of the San Francisco Tape Center. Yeah, I was not aware of that. I, I know McCarty did spend some time in San Francisco in early 67. And, um, you know, he was very open to all of that stuff. So he may have got it sent to him as well. So mm -hmm. yeah, he, he was... He didn't, he didn't get credit for that once Lennon married Yoko Ono and took on this avant-garde kind of persona. Um, and then in the Lennon Remembers narrative, he, he gave himself credit for being the avant-garde Beatle. And really, McCartney was the guy who brought that to the band. You see it as early as Tomorrow Never Knows on Revolver, which is 1966. Mm -hmm. And that was, more, that was more McCartney's doing. So he that's the tape loops that they were literally using, and they had to use little pencils to keep the loop going in a you know in a circle and hold them up to the microphone so it was really primitive and uh that was mccartney's doing and then sample based music and loops became all the rage through the let's say starting late 70s through the 80s there was a the great loop scare hopefully we're over looping now it's just like they call it ambient music or something like that it has its roots in that the Tape Music Center and via the Beatles, who were the great popularizers of virtually all of uh, Western music history and Eastern history. And I know this might outrage Harrison fans, but wouldn't you say that he's guilty of Orientalism? You mean appropriate cultural appropriation? <laughs> I guess that's what they call it these days, but well, Edward him. Said called it Orientalism. Oh, did he? Um, yeah, yeah, the Beatles are given credit, and I think they do deserve credit for bringing a lot of this stuff to the mainstream. And Indian music, I think, was one of them, although it had been around. And it wasn't like it. Ravi Shankar, the guy that became, he was the, 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 uh, the brilliant musician from India, became a teacher to Harrison. He had been around recording albums for quite a long time. And Harrison just ended up taking to it and bringing it into the Beatles' music. And he it's, he got into it so much that he he basically gave up the guitar for a while and was doing just the sitar. So this is in the Sgt. Pepper, uh, in, into the White Album period, 1967. Mm -hmm. So there's not a lot of Harrison. There's some guitar, but it's it's more filled with this more colorful recorders and orchestration. And, you know, Sgt. Pepper is very orchestrated. And uh, there's mm -hmm. not a ton of guitar on it, and that's part of the reason, because George Harrison wasn't showing up with his guitar in hand. Right. And then we, when he did reemerge as a guitar, as qua guitar, it was playing that slide guitar. Yeah. It's when... He did a lot of slide, and I'll have to confess, I'm, I didn't appreciate it, and I still don't appreciate his slide playing. 
Yeah, I, I got into a little bit of trouble recently. I did a, a review on um, the album All Things Must Pass, his first solo album. And the slide that he plays, which he kind of calls a cute slide, it's kind of a, I call it a kind of a bubblegummy type of slide, which is, doesn't sound like the bluesy slide playing of John mm -hmm. Mayall's Blues Breakers with like Mick Taylor and guys like that. Mm -hmm. So I just think Harrison overused that sound when he, when he wanted to come up with his own sound and took the time to do that. Outside of the protection of the Beatles, by the way, he because yeah. the Beatles probably said, "Okay, let's change this up a little bit," because the Beatles weren't into repeating themselves. I think Harrison just overused it, and he became a better slide guitar player as the years went on. In fact, his album that came out after he died has got some of his best slide playing. I think mm -hmm. brainwashed. Well, of contemporary artists, uh, I think Butch Trucks is a good proponent of of what what was done. Speaking of overuse, his relative's uncle, uh, uh, Allman, Greg, not Greg Allman, Dwayne Allman, the, uh, again, this is kind of Beatles related to six degrees of separation. And again, I, I'm trying to focus on the heretical statements here today because, you know, the Beatles are not sacred for me. They're, they're uh, amenable to criticism just like any other artist. But uh, the outro to Layla, Talk about overused. That was horrible. That was Dwayne Allman, that really long outro of Layla with the piano. Yeah. I think it was Nicky Hopkins on the piano, right? The outro. The song itself was the body, the main body of the song. Excellent. Although someone, I can't remember who it was, said that they caught that that lick, the Layla lick from uh, Albert King. Ah. That Slowed down. And it does sound like an Albert King lick but anyway slide guitar i think really brought down george harrison's artistry yeah i would also add to that that he became essentially an adult contemporary songwriter his music mm. really doesn't rock i mean he doesn't do anything as nearly as hard rocking as tax man really in any of his solo a couple minor exceptions but generally speaking he was a singer songwriter he kind of mm. gave up the guitar he didn't really focus on it as much and so about, very good how about uh if if uh if i needed someone that's harrison that is harrison and like some great three-part harmony on that and that's the electric 12 string guitar which i also feel that it's too bad that that electric 12 string guitar got so overused by that folk rock period that <laughs> harrison just kind of put it away said ah we're hearing enough of this and i i, I wish he would have used it here and there throughout the rest of his career in the, in the beatles anyway I know. I have a confession to make. I have a reissue Rickenbacker 360 12 string. <laughs> it's, oh, you. Yeah, it's modeled just after the same uh, the one that George Harrison used. It's one of my prized possessions. Um, but yeah, so as far as George Harrison is concerned, um, I was reminded in, in preparing for our conversation here that he had a hit single in the British charts. It was Hare Krishna. Oh, that was, uh, yeah, I think he produced that. Yeah. For, yes. Yeah, that was a pretty big hit. And in the States, it was covered by a different group. I forget who covered it in the in, in England, in the UK. In America, it was done by, I think, The Happenings, a, a band you wouldn't think would have done that. But yeah, so the Harrison, this whole Hare Krishna thing was fit in pretty well with the whole hippie movement. And that just was filling the, you know, finding its way into the pop charts as well. Mm -hmm. Age of the he, yeah, you can see that uh, performance of Hare Krishna on uh, YouTube. It's up there, and it just accelerates. It goes faster and faster and faster until it reaches an orgiastic climax. Okay, and the reason why I'm kind of setting up this great reveal here to you is, is, um, is that I have this idea that uh, George Harrison was some part of a uh, tantric sex cult. This is my historiographic reveal for today's show, Matt. That I, I want people heard. to mull that over. Yeah, I mean, I, that I had not heard, and I haven't. Oh, that's original to me. With that is, to me. yeah. This, you're the first person to hear this, okay? Private or or publicly, okay. George Harrison was, uh, I suspect, a member of a tantric sex cult. You know. Um, uh, Dr. Stewart talks about the Vedic elements of the Beatles imported through Harrison. 
I think it was tantric. And the reason is, well, it's uh, it's convoluted reason, but you know, out people like Aleister Crowley and these mystics show up um, on uh, the Sgt. Pepper album, right? And we know that Harrison was exploring these traditions. And for me, the clincher is, and it's not really a clincher, because this is still a working hypothesis, Matt, Okay, is that his wife, Olivia, even said that this guy couldn't keep his cod in his trousers. Yeah. Every woman he met, he wanted to sleep with, and he succeeded with it. Yeah, I mean. So you talk I about can... Meet the Beatles. It was like, you know, Meet the meet the Beatles, whatever it was. <laughs> he was. He was promiscuous. Yes. And I know that he went through periods of, you know, partying and things in the 70s, and he got very sick. He got. Um, hepatitis C, I think. And mm -hmm. uh, he had to stop drinking and stop a lot of things. And he, that was about 1977, 78. He had no albums in either of those years. So he was kind of, I think, convalescing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he, he occasionally would hit it hard. And he, I know he did so in the early 70s when he went through his divorce with his wife. Mm -hmm. So yeah, he, he was, uh, I mean, I can't imagine the Beatles, I mean, what the amount of women throwing themselves at you would have been like, how that would have been very hard to, mm -hmm. <laughs> to pass. Them. Well, you know, back to the days when he was, what, 16 years old at the Reaper Bond or 17 mm -hmm. with the Silver Beatles playing like that, which is just mm -hmm. a, a site for prostitution and, and women and, and drink and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But his own personal assistant, uh, Harrison, said that he he would turn around and in one moment he'd be super spiritual because that's what that's what i had thought for many many years he's a spiritual quiet people <laughs> and then this new information started to come out right saying oh he was a hump lord even more so than john lennon and yeah. i'm taking it further i'm saying this is part of his religiosity the sex through spiritual or spiritual enlightenment through tantric yoga could very well be um because he did dabble he kind of went in and out though like you said he he was not consistent and it seems to me if you're going to be consistent if you're looking for some kind of uh, spiritual uh, enlightenment you have to have some consistency which he apparently didn't have so i don't really know in later years of what he how he did it but mm -hmm. certainly in the 70s he was rather promiscuous well, according to certain sources, uh, maybe not in the very end when he was sick, right? But um, it would he it would he would turn on a dime. One moment he's super spiritual, the next moment he says, "Let's go find a party and snort some coke," and yeah. like, it's just just like that. So that yeah. to me sounds like a, someone who has a fragmented identity. I don't want to psychoanalyze him post mortem, but um, he was troubled. George yeah. Harrison was troubled. Yeah, and you know when you have your uh, your LSD period and you do copious amounts of it, and he I don't he probably didn't, he didn't do as much as Lennon, but you know that I think does affect a lot of your psyche. It certainly did for Lennon. A lot of musicians they just never got past some of the excesses of the drug use. And what part did that play in that? I don't know, but I, I would imagine it it didn't help. Mm -hmm. Someone uh, chimes in, pseudoscientists, that, about uh, occult sex magic. And uh, the more I'm doing the uh, reading on it, I think there's, there's a, a great deal to be said about that. Um, one, one of the historiographic interventions I would like to put forth is that the British occult revival is not fully considered in Beatles historiography. That's how a lot of these characters showed up on Sgt. Pepper. And that's what they're, who were they were reading. And part of it was the Indian so-called, you know, Paramahansa Yogananda and Swami Vivekananda and all these. Uh, and then later Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. And there's even a kind of a, a slightly derisive aside by McCartney in the, in the Get Back documentary about something they were working on. I think it was Harrison piece. He's, oh, it, it's, it smells like curry, mm. yeah, which means it's, it's Indian. <laughs> That's kind of a, a slur and it. They kind of gloss over it in the film. Uh, Cause not everybody was on board of it with it, but um, 
people like Alistair Crowley, who features prominently on on the on the um, on the Sergeant Pepper cover art by Peter Blake, as someone mentioned here, who's in the live stream, was the uh, magus of occult sex magic. Which further supports, I think, my hypothesis about um, Harrison being part of some sort of a tantric Hindu uh, yogic uh, sex cult. Well, that certainly would be something that people in the swing of the 60s would have been interested in. And I know that <laughs> to, I read uh, one great biography is uh, Marianne Faithful's got a couple of them, but one that I read, I think it's just called Faithful. She talked read about that because yeah. um, she became. Uh, well, she was rather promiscuous herself. And what she said is like, the idea was in the 60s, if it felt good, you did it. And mm -hmm. if you were a rock star. I mean, someone like Marianne Faithful who gave up her, her, pops, her pop stardom to, to connect with Jagger and to support his work with the right. Stones. I mean, she could indulge in whatever without much repercussion. Uh, mm -hmm. And Grace Slick has said this of Jefferson Airplane too. You know, it's easy to do this when you're a rock star. But the tune in, mm -hmm. turn on, drop out thing doesn't work so good from a, a young 16 year old in um, Boise, Idaho, maybe. You know, mm -hmm. so yeah, the, all that swing in 60s stuff and all that, everything that was non conventional, which would include the occult, all that stuff was in play. And it was all mm -hmm. being sampled and read. And yeah, definitely. And Marianne Faithful in that biography that you autobiography that you cited claims that she is a uh, a blood relative of Leopold von Sacher Masoch that's from right. which the the term sadomasochism is derived yes so it's in her bloodline it is yes it is and she um yeah very strange uh a lot of these these figures in the 60s um the choices they made i guess that's why we're talking about them because they made some bad choices and they made the papers but and she mm -hmm. would be one of them if they made a bunch of good choices you probably would hear about them but uh, yeah it was just one of those things in the 60s it was completely uh preferred to go against any convention which was against mm -hmm. you know christianity government police um any kind of convention that was had been around for thousands of years mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of which, the part of the Br British uh, occult revival was the revival of paganism in the British Isles. I'm just finding out more about that now, and thanks to your channel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, that whole, um, what was it, the early dawn, that Crowley business from... O OTO. Early, yeah, early part of the century, how it revived a lot, and the rock music was a almost a vehicle for it because the the paganism that went along with that could be performed in concert settings so it, it was just it was the right combination and it was a, a, another way to deliver different messages that were you know not in vogue in the 60s hippie culture mm -hmm. and one of the persons who had studied with Crowley and, and eventually broke with him or went his own direction was the person who's the founder of modern witchcraft which is all the rage, by the way, in Anglo-America and English-speaking Commonwealth areas all over the United States. And uh, a lot of it is behind what we're seeing as uh, critical race theory, GLBTQ, and it goes under the name of a religion, quote-unquote, called Wicca, mm -hmm. W-I-C-C-A. Mm -hmm. And there they have the bookstores, usually lesbian-oriented, in every city around the country here, and it's probably the same in, in Britain. Wicca of religion. That was Gerald Gardner. His thing was this sex magic in the paganism. Uh, the Wicker Man. Did you see the original version of the Wicker Man? No, I did not. These, these blood ritual, human animal sacrifices that the pagans, the Druids, I'm not Druid, not Druid, Druid specifically, but Druidic like peoples that lived in the British Isles, pre Christian, in other words had these traditions of human sacrifice. And the reason I mention this is because, ladies and gentlemen, we're not just talking about the 60s here. We're talking about the era of Jeffrey Epstein because the recent drop ring, uh, of the names talks about witchcraft and animal sacrifice. Yes, it's part of that milieu there. It's interesting how all that goes along with that very elitist, globalist 
the biggest money in the world, how they have these little secret parties. You can imagine the parties that these people would have. I mean, I've been to a couple parties in my day, nothing on too big of a level, but <laughs> I mean, I can imagine when you're at such a high level of wealth and power that that party would take on a different tone or could. And if there's nobody watching you, they, they may indulge in some of some very dark stuff. So I think it's, it's very dark to look into that stuff and we're, it's being, put on the front pages now with this Epstein. They're trying not to really explain what's going on, but that is it mm. in, in miniature. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's a reality that is going to help rescue Beatleology or Beatles historiography from the candy ass stage that it's been in for the last 40 years. Like, who do you like better, Paul or John? Or John said this, Paul said this, Ringo said nothing. You know, we have to look at, I, this is my argument. It's not an original one by any stretch of the imagination. We have to look at the Beatles or any popular culture phenomenon. Everybody within your realm of study, pop goes the sixties has to be looked through this framework of, of uh, hardcore reality, including gangsterism mm -hmm. and, Political compromise, blackmail, bribery. I mean, the Beatles, you know, let's not stray from the Beatles. Beatles were steeped in it, right? You've read the book about uh, Morris Levy or Morris Levy? Yeah, yeah. There was, there was a lot of gangsterism going on. And particularly in, in England, you had some of the Cray brothers. They were getting involved in, in popular music because it was you could make money doing it. And um, oh, yes. the army, you know, the father-in-law of Ozzy Osbourne, he, that, he started making money managing pop bands, and you can muscle record companies and muscle the artists, that's for sure. So that's yeah, was the really father of Sharon Osbourne. Correct. Yeah, the Cray brothers were so perverted. They were identical twins. They were so perverted that uh, it's been reported that they slept with each other. Oh, really? How late yeah. did they and do they that? Were, they were integral to the pop music scene that the Beatles would have been involved with and most people don't really pick this up in some of these books but uh brian epstein died a horrible violent death by beating you know i heard about that and i i didn't i was looking to see the source on that because mm -hmm. i i had the stuff i have it talked about um it didn't go into that at all that he died in his room and he had he was in, well, you know, he was into rough trade, so that yes. wouldn't surprise many people. Mm -hmm. I think, um, yeah, I, I don't know too much about a death outside of just an accidental overdose, it may have been partially. He was a very troubled guy, I, I wouldn't necessarily call it an accidental overdose, but yeah, I don't know about uh, a beating. Mm -hmm. Well, he would be seen with uh, bruises on his face on occasion that uh, he would attribute to a fall in the bathroom, yeah. but it, he must have fallen quite a bit. But I too have heard the stories about rough trade. And there's a new book out by a former member of parliament. Her last name is Doris. And she has a book called the, the plot. It hasn't been released in America yet. Not until April. I have an advanced order in, but it's making sensation because it's talking about this very milieu we're taught we're dealing with right now. The plot and it goes up to the highest levels. Now we know about Jimmy Savile, right? Yeah. By now, oh yeah. So Savile is he was in that whole mix. He was, um, I, don't, I don't know if he had connections to the Cray brothers or any of these the gangsters, but he certainly was a, a media giant. He became a beloved figure. And he, if what I what's true that they write about him, it is dark. Yes, and uh, he was uh, photographed on many occasions with the Beatles himself, and I guess he hung out with them. A lot of people hung out with him, so that in itself is not incriminating. Uh, but he was also tight with the royal family. That's I, I've heard that. Yeah, the current King Charles, for example, then Prince Charles. Mm. So, uh, and he was remember he was also a, a representative. He was in the, under the employ of the BBC. Auntie Beeb was employing Jimmy Savile, which implies that there were people and that the Beeb helped bring the Beatles to prominence, as we know, right? BBC, the great tapes that have been released in album form. 
um, he must the the upper echelon of of um, Auntie B must have known about the the mischief that Jimmy Savile was up to him and others. He wasn't the only one. Yeah, and I it it was just covered up, and he was so beloved. They just they thought it'd be best to cover it up instead of bust him and put him in the stockade forever. I don't know, you know, I it's the it's a level of power I'll never understand. I don't want to understand it really, but. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, very, very troubling. Well, we can move away from that unpleasant topic if you like, but let me just recommend another book since uh, we're all into this that I found quite uh, illuminating. I'm not making a pun here <laughs> because maybe the bloodlines of the Illuminati are involved with pop music. Maybe they're the ones who are uh, financing, but here's an excellent book. It's called Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the 60s by Tom O'Neill. And that and, just and came out recently. That's a couple years old, is that right? It's only a few years old, yeah. It's a, um, My friend. Yeah, go ahead. And yeah, 2019. Okay, 2019. yeah, a good friend of mine, uh, Denise, if you're watching, um, she's a kind <laughs> of Manson. Hi, Denise. Kind of followed Manson a little bit, and not, not just, just the history of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I saw... Uh, I, I did see uh, an interview with uh, O'Neill talking about his book. I thought, wow, this would be great for her. And I, I was fascinated by what he had to say. And I was very, I could tell right away that he, he was credible because he's using a great deal of documentation. It's mm -hmm. not a lot of wild theories. He's basing things on interviews with former uh, parole officers and really some good sources. And I was impressed mm -hmm. with what I heard. So how did you like the book? Uh, it's excellent. There's some uh, questions I would have uh, for, for the author, but I think he has a lot of um, standing because he was a professional journalist. That in itself, of course, does not make him legitimate, but a lot of these books that we're reading in articles and people who are pundits on the Beatles or ex experts, we don't even need to mention their names. Mm -hmm. Um, they're just, uh, you know, wankers so far as I'm concerned, <laughs> but yeah. they, they don't have that type of, um, gravitas or background. And he has all his notes from interviewing people. I was just reading it over again before our, our conversation here is in kind of with Terry Melker. Right. Yeah. Does that ring a bell to you? Yeah. Terry Melker, the son of Doris Day, who was a producer in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. produced people like the birds and, uh, was tight with the Beach Boys and a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, Melcher was, uh, in fact, it was interesting because from what I remember uh, hearing in the book, Melcher, I think, perjured himself in court with regard to having seen Manson another time. It just brought some question into why why Melcher felt the need to lie. Or, I don't know. It's um, very interesting, though, because every, people were scared. And I, I don't know. It, the, the music industry in Los Angeles in the 60s, this was it was this, the, the music capital of the world and a lot of money and um, um, you know you just had to keep the money rolling in well when i first re reading about uh, terry melker or melcher who is the son of doris day which is the embodiment of american wholesome uh, wholesomeness you know circa 1950 early 60s That's uh i associate him with the beatles and the beatles are not the beatles the beach boys and the uh, beatles of course i I associated with, you know, two girls for every boy. We're going to surf city, you know, all that yeah. fun in the sun, which itself had a dark side to it as well as, as we find out subsequently. But Melcher was, my gosh, he threatened, oh, it's a document in the O'Neill book. He threatened to take his briefcase and throw it off his, the top story of his penthouse on Ocean Boulevard in Santa Monica. And he said, you know, I ha I know people who will take care of people like you, rats. Who, who are you doing this for? No. This is the real world of pop music going back to the assassination of Sam Cooke, the yeah. murder of Sam. I was a kid living in L.A. when Sam Cooke was murdered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is shortly before the, the Watts riots of 1965. He was the first black man to own his own publishing and his own label. And that has a Beale connection as well with his his manager was Alan Klein. That's where Klein really started to make some money with his dealing, shall we say. And we already mentioned Morris Levy. Mm -hmm. 
they had a relationship there. Klein was trained as a, I don't know if he was a CPA, but he was trained as an accountant. Okay. So by this time, we're seeing uh, so-called organized crime fuse with corporate crime. And that's where we're at today in 2020. That's why I'm studying this, mm -hmm. this body of work. I want to see the, the development, the evolution of how state capture occurs. And we're in a captured state in 2024. Um, I don't know if you would agree with that, <laughs> you know, that nutshell no, assessment. And the music was kind of like the soundtrack to that. Yeah. And that's one of the great things about one of the differences between the 60s, 70s, or even 80s to some degree. The music reflecting the times more. I mean, I guess today's music does reflect the times, but the mainstream music of today is just so, um, so orchestrated or so this laptop mm -hmm. music creating it's not really made by artists it's made by you know programmers algorithms mm -hmm. by the way the Take king of, of pop music is not no longer la or new york it's stockholm Stockholm, right uh, max martin right exactly and spotify which is a swedish company well, i didn't really recently there's been articles saying that spotify is used by these international human and drug trafficking criminal syndicates for money laundering. It's interesting. Uh, there's a guy I've been following, Ted Joya, who's a, a writer, and he's been writing about uh, Spotify and some of these other uh, uh, mediums that stream music, streaming services, and how they're they're not set up to. You can't make money doing them. Right. The artist can't. So when I saw when you sent me that link, I thought, well, this makes some sense because how are they still in operation? And there must be some other things going on. The whole Stockholm thing and, and the Max Martin thing, the whole programmable mainstream music, it's making some sense to me. I mean, they've, they've taken this. Is, and this is the difference between 60s music. Well, really 20th century music, I would say, and music of today is they've removed the art from it. They remove the soul. They remove the human, and that's the easiest way I can explain the differentiation between what I'm saying is the two centuries of music, roughly speaking. Hmm. Um, but as we know, um, criminality was at the heart of pop music from the inception. Right. right. As soon as there was a buck to be made in the jukebox business or whatever it was, race records or RCA, the Radio Corporation of America. I mean, they moved, they opened up studios in Nashville as early as 1925, because mm. they knew where it was going and they were going to be directing the drift of cultural change. And that's where these people who say, well, it was all, uh, uh, you know, a cons the Beatles were just a, a conspiracy, right? They're the product of a larger, cons but, but if, even if they were, they would not be alone in that. And it far predated them. And it's going on now. So I think a lot of that stuff that's we're hearing today on TubeView or BoobTube is a lot of disinformation. And it might be coming from intelligence agencies. I don't know. Or yeah. it could be just stupidity by the people. Because I, I guarantee you, Matt, after we're done with this, in the comments, it's going to say... Yeah, Paul is dead, and the Beatles were um, a synthetic group uh, created by MI6. Right. right. Which is, I find to be utterly laughable, because what they're suggesting is that government or covert government, whatever you want to call it, can create art. And I, that can't happen. It's, not, it's almost mm -hmm. not possible to suggest that all this music uh, that that was created can just be concocted out of nothing and to just to to do what the Beatles or a lot of other bands did uh, is preposterous. Mm -hmm. And so the, the the answer does lie in what you said, and that is the corrupt business of popular music. I mean, you show me you show me uh, an artist in popular music from the 20th century till now that hasn't been totally screwed, and I'll show you an empty room. <laughs> I mean, the artists get screwed. They steal it. 
and then they mon- they monetize it and they they sell it back to us. Mm-hmm. They get screwed, or they die, or both. Yeah, I mean, within <laughs> our living memory, we have Michael Jackson and we have Prince. Yeah, right. We already mentioned Sam Cooke and other and black man i think all otis redding was also interested in owning his own publishing because as you know this is where the the bucks are right oh yes big money is the publishing now the good part about it is, and i don't know if you would agree with this is that taking inspiration for all the organic music that was being made by the 60s regardless of people like alan klein and morris levy and there's tons of other ones by the way Mike Kerb could be one of them. I'm just throwing the name out there. He seems to be his name. He's certain, but he's like Dick Clark is, seems to be immune from any sort of really uh, deep criticism or dark criticism. But um, I see that because the music business model, because of streaming is dying, Spotify, now it's known that it's a corrupt entity and m- artists themselves aren't making any money. I see a sort of a revival of late 50s, 60s garage rock and bands of uh, young men and women who are or teenagers who are making their own music, and there's going to be a huge audience for it. Yeah, I, I can see that coming as well. And then just a groundswell of people, do-it-yourselfers, and a lot yes. of that happens now, but they just don't get heard. But I think that it's getting to the point where some of this stuff will catch on like some of the old music caught on, and then I'll just that'll be ripe for stealing by a corporation as well. But <laughs> we're going to have a blip here, I think, where we're going to get back to some of, some of that, because I just don't see how you can keep remanufacturing and reselling the same thing over and over again. I mean, maybe we're that dumb, maybe we're that programmed that that's what we're going to do. I I have more optimism than that. I think it's it gets more religious though if you want to really get into it. But um, it's you know has to do with soul and everything. So, mm-hmm. but yeah, it, it, it's it's a very big concept, and I think the music is if you follow the music, in, instead of in this case following the money, you might find your soul. Well, I share that optimism with you. Uh, no matter how desperately the state or corporations try to suppress human creativity and spirit and soul and funk, whatever it is that comes out of the human experience, it's never complete. And there's always a, and I think the Beatles, John Lennon, Paul McCartney, Richard Starkey, George Harrison, as teenagers, as pre-teenagers, were part of that post-war rebirth of Britain. And I know um, Stewart makes a lot of the, Professor Stewart here makes a lot out of the fact that these groups like that, like the Beatles, were coming to the fore as Britain's geographic empire was declining. Mm -hmm. Its symbolic empire was expanding, but its geographic empire was contracting. So do you see something similar happening here in the United States? Because I think you and I can probably agree that most of the music, let's say emblematic of um, Taylor Swift, for example, is Drek. Yeah, I mean it's insipid. It's you know derivative. I it it doesn't it doesn't call to me at all. It doesn't move me. Um, yeah, it's interesting that the Beatles. I think the Beatles could have only happened in England and post-war England because really the way I, I'm not a World War II buff, but that was World War II was the last stand almost for for the UK, and they they gave it everything. They, we we won the war because of their ingenuity. Without it, we, I don't think we could have done it. And it crippled the nation so much that the Beatles grew up in that decay. And I think that's what gave them the creativity to bust out of that. Whereas in America, after World War II, it was like the Beach Boys, man. It was like beaches. I mean, not literally all across the nation, but it was a, a great period of, of, of great success and growing business and mm-hmm. just Herbs, everything. So things. Everybody had a had a beach across the USA, right? Yeah. So things here happened a little bit differently, but yeah. Fun, so, fun, fun till Daddy takes T Bird away. Well, yeah. I mean, to have a T Bird to be taken away, I still didn't ever got a T Bird. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that 
something can happen uh, very big where the music will reflect, uh, you know, like like jazz or blues, where it was reflecting hardship, and that's mm. where the beauty came from. Yeah. Well, I'm looking forward to that uh, resurgence, and I think it might come out of Milwaukee, no, the South Side. <laughs> And it's going to be thanks to people like you who are teaching the new generation of musicians and artists their own history. Yeah, I think that um, in learning about not just the music, but the, the artists themselves, there, there is a story there and it's a human story. And that's what I'm telling by going into these band histories that I've been doing and, and even diving into the Beatles deeper because there, there's... The deeper you dive on the Beatles, the more interesting they become. It just it seems to be a, the gift that keeps giving. You know, I don't know how long I can keep up. I think, I actually think the Beatles are, as we're aging out, you know, it, the Beatles are going to become more and more of a niche, I believe, like jazz is today. Mm -hmm. and, um, but I think their place will be secure in the in the, in the history books for sure, as being a, a huge, a huge, uh, giving a huge amount of art to the world. Well, that's an interesting projection that you put forth. Now, as we wind up here, what um, what do we have to look forward to on Pop Goes the 60s? Any, I'm sure there will be, but are you going to give us a little idea of the type of interviews you're going to be doing? Yeah, I, I, I've got a couple of things lined up. I'm just finishing my expansive Beach Boy series. I'm in part six here, and that, that was quite an undertaking. And... Um, to tell a, a, the story of a band that that big, it takes some doing. So I'm going to take a little break from the longer pieces and do some more obscure bands here coming up, British and England and United States bands, maybe a Canadian band here or there. There's so much to do. I've got 10 years worth of topics. So I'll, I'll never run out. <laughs> but I've got, I do, I'm mean, lining up some interviews. I don't want to give too much away in case they don't come to fruition, but okay. I will sprinkle in some interviews in there. Uh, we're going to be reflecting on. Uh, uh, I think I'm going to look at some also some some concert events of the '60s that were groundbreaking and turn points in, in the decade. Interesting. That I might be doing in, in uh, early part of uh, 2024. I get requests all the time. You know, the Hollies, the Supremes. Can you do this band? Can you do that band? So, pretty much everybody's on my very long list. It's just a matter of time. Is can I live long enough to do them all? Okay. So how can people reach you to make requests or to support your channel? You have a really great website and you're going to start uh, providing merchandise to the public. Do you want to talk about? I've been very to fortunate uh, to have my, my viewers request that I offer some merchandise. So that can be found on my website, popgoes60s.com. Uh, you can find my videos. The bulk of my work is all videos on YouTube. That's also Pop Goes the Sixties. And I've got a Patreon uh, support uh, a subscription that you can support there as well. But check out the channel, see if you like it. I would say half of my content is pretty heavily Beatles. The thing that really put me on the map, I think, was the get back period. I happened to do a lot of uh, videos on the get back before Peter Jackson stuff came out, where I was transcribing what the Beatles were, were saying so we can eavesdrop on their conversations. And a lot of that uh, Jackson didn't use. So I had one fan that said, well, Matt, we need to we need your videos to get a, even a fuller picture of what Peter Jackson did. So that was a great compliment. And I think mm -hmm. that's really going forward. We're going to need multiple people to continue to fill in the gaps and the empty gaps of the history. So I think I, I learned something from that. Okay. We can conclude there. Incredible. Um, I know you're working on uh, Joe Meek. We talked privately. Yeah. I guess like are, to you, are you ready to give us a... To whet our appetite on, on the weird Joe Meek? Well, Joe Meek was a weird one. He's kind of a, um, what would you say, a, a, a dark ver darker version of Brian Epstein. <laughs> he, he I'm didn't sorry to laugh. He, was, he, um, he committed suicide. Yeah, very, well, I'll, I'll get into that, but that'll be, that won't be a very long video. But he, he's a very pivotal guy. He was basically the Phil Spector of Britain. Yeah, incredible. Well, Matt, thank you very much. I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, this Sunday to uh, chat with us. And I'm sure you're going to get an incredible response to some of the provocative 
uh, little streams we opened up here today, which is the idea. Exactly. We're, we're into discussing these things a little more deeper. And Daryl, I, I really appreciate you having me on. This was great fun. It's my pleasure and my privilege. Thank you, Matt Williamson of Pop Goes the 60s. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. That's our time for today. We'll see you next Sunday. God willing. <laughs> Bye. Hang in there for a second. Matt, I'll talk to you off air. <laughs>